brethren, it's certainly good to be able to come once again to this area, to be here at this meeting. We've enjoyed so much over the years coming this way, your fellowship, good times together in the service of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and trying for the divine worship service of Almighty God. I'm thankful that you brethren in this area are still contending for those wonderful truths and beautiful doctrines of God's Word, of the practice, and of the discipline and the order of the church of God, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've got to hold fast unto these things until He comes. We've got to hold fast. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth for them to keep the ordinances as they had been delivered unto them. He made no bones about it. He did not give them an option concerning that as far as what his will was and uh, what their duty should be. Now, uh, we know that uh, uh, God expects of us because we read the admonitions and the exhortations in his word. This book is full of admonitions. This book is full of exhortations. Brethren, we are not as a computer. We are not pre-programmed. We are not, as uh, uh, far as uh, the moral uh, uh, conduct and standard that the Word of God speaks unto us, it is not absolute uh, uh, unto us. Now, it's absolute with God as far as what God is concerned about it and what God says about it, but it is not absolute that we will obey it and do it the way that we ought to. Uh, there's a lot uh, uh, of things that folks some, from time to time kind of gets mixed up uh, along those lines. I'm not real schooled in physics as probably as a lot of you are, and, and some of you that I would think of in particular and so forth. But as I understand, the laws of physics are certain and absolute. And that uh, with every action, there's always an opposite reaction. You can count upon it every time. Matter of fact, the very reason that we have the technology that we have today is because of the laws of physics and because of what man has learned and understand and understands when it comes uh, uh, to physics. Uh, therefore, the technology has been developed. Uh, and, and as man has become more informed and acquainted along those lines, more and more technology has developed and come along uh, from that standpoint, uh, I can make you a guarantee that you can go out in this parking lot and you can throw a rock up in the air and you can throw it as far as you can throw it. Uh, but when the force uh, that you have to propel that rock into the air, when it is exhausted, that propelling, uh, uh, because of the law of gravity, that rock is going to come back down to the ground. Now that's going to happen every time. You can count on that. That's absolute. It's absolute the reason why Psalms 19 in verse 1 can declare that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth forth His handiwork. Uh, how can it be that every time you look into the heavens, uh, the glory of God is displayed? Uh, and those heavenly bodies, uh, they preach uh, every day to the power and the glory of God. Uh, and they preach in every language uh, under the sun. That's what uh, Psalms 19 goes on to talk to us about. And I'm not going to take the time to turn there and read to those verses, but day unto day utter speech. You Bible readers know where I am. 
Uh, you know where I am talking about that right there. Uh, the reason that the, the heavenly bodies, the heavens, the skies, the heavens that you can look up into, they declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth His handiwork in day and to day. Uh, that is done uh, day and to day. They speak. They are God's preachers in the sky declaring uh, the absoluteness of God, that God is absolute uh, uh, that God will always be God and He will never fail to be God. He will never fail. He will never fail because of His divine nature. The very characteristic and attribute of God, and this is something that we need to hold up before our eyes, our mind, our attention every day of our life and concentrate and center upon is the thrice holiness of Almighty God. That God is holy, that God is pure, that God is undefiled. God has never sinned. God does not have the ability to sin. God cannot lie. God, the Bible plainly tells us He cannot lie. Lying is a sin, is it not? Lying is a sin. God cannot sin. God has never sinned and God never will. Now, we can't say that with us. We are not absolute uh, uh, when it comes uh, uh, to the moral conduct and standard. Uh, we are not as the laws of physics. Uh, uh, us human beings. Uh, uh, this old heart is, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Uh, and who can know it? Uh, we don't even react uh, uh, to the same things uh, at different times the same way. Now under the laws of physics, uh, uh, everything is going to act and react exactly the same way as it does every time. It will never change. Uh, but under the moral uh, law and conduct uh, and so forth along those lines, uh, uh, we don't even uh, uh, act and react uh, uh, from day to day uh, the same way. Let me give you an example. Uh, some years ago, I, I, I had uh, an employer, a boss man, if you please, uh, and I made complaints uh, uh, to my wife a lot of times. Uh, uh, I can't understand this man. He doesn't act and react to the same thing from time to time. I don't know how to please him because... Under this circumstance, what will please him this time, it won't please him the next time. Under the same circumstance and situation. You know, I really wasn't doing a whole lot of thinking. Because it wasn't long till my wife began to turn that around on me. And she's sitting right out here. And she would repeat to me what I said about that employer. I can't understand you. I don't understand a lot of times. I, I, I don't know. You don't uh, uh, react the same way as you have acted before under the same circumstance, under the same situation. And that is because we do not exist and we do not operate under an absolute uh, uh, control uh, or principles. Uh, uh, when you read over there where it says, add to your faith virtue, Virtue is a high moral standard of living. That's what the word virtue means. A high moral standard of living. And here the word of God exhorts us and tells us to add that to our faith. Now we that have a hope of faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we have a body of belief and a conduct and disciples of the Lord. He's telling us that we should add a high moral standard of actions and conduct while we live right here on the shores of time. Kind of like along that same line as Brother Heath was talking about. Uh, as God said, be ye holy even as I am holy. And then I read uh, the old age apostle John when he says in 1 John, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Here's an exhortation. 
Here's admonition to us that have a hope in Christ Jesus uh, uh, that we should conduct ourselves and live and separate ourselves uh, uh, from things uh, unto God uh, uh, that we would live a pure life. Uh, uh, the scripture teaches us much about that. It teaches us much about the holiness of God. It teaches us much about the purity of God. And it holds up a standard. Certainly it does. It holds up a standard of admonitions unto us. When I read where the apostle says to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be truly furnished unto all good works. The scriptures as God has given them by inspiration. God breathed and we have them recorded. That teaches us... Uh, as I've said many a times, this book tells us more about uh, uh, our life and living uh, and how we ought to live uh, and what the Lord uh, uh, says for us concerning in the way of discipleship and a way of following the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, than it does about anything else. Than it does about anything else. Uh, as a matter of fact, as we well know, the word save, save, salvation, and so forth, uh, is meaning and speaking of deliverance, uh, uh, there's more said about it in a temporal sense than it is in an eternal sense uh, in God's Word. Uh, and God's Word teaches us uh, uh, that there are blessings in obedience uh, and that there is chastisement uh, in disobedience. Certainly there is. We have to ever remember these things uh, and uh, to understand from the, uh, that standpoint uh, of, of the holiness and of the purity of God and of our weakness and so forth uh, and, and that, that it is not just given and that we're not programmed and that we're not just automatically going to do right uh, and do the things that we ought to do to think the things that we ought to think uh, to say the things that we ought to say. How many times uh, have we said, Oh, I wish I'd have never said that. I wish I'd have never walked uh, in that direction. Uh, I wish I'd have worded that uh, uh, a little bit differently. Uh, oh, yes, we do. Why? Because afterwards there's that uh, of the Spirit of God in us that begins to stir uh, and causes us to realize uh, uh, that we have spoke out of turn, that we have thought out of, out of the way, uh, uh, that it is not pleasing uh, unto our Lord, unto our heavenly Father. So if, if we realize the distinction uh, concerning uh, the laws of physics, you see the sun, the S-U-N, the sun that you go out here and you look up into the sky and you see the S-U-N, the sun cannot sin. The sun cannot trans transgress. And according to 1 John, what is sin? It's the transgression of God's law. The Son cannot transgress God's moral law, and it certainly cannot uh, transgress or sin against God's physic law that governs it in and of itself. The Son cannot act differently from that that God has ordained it to act. The stars cannot act of their own accord and act differently than what God has ordained them to be and the way that they should act. That's absolute. And uh, I tell you what the absoluter will do. He'll try to fill your mind with all of those kind of things, all of those kind of texts and so forth, and pick a little here and a little there, and then try to prove to you that God has predetermined whatsoever comes to pass, uh, uh, good, uh, uh, evil, sinful, wicked, or indifferent. Now, the sovereignty of God is not under question anyway. But the sovereignty of God is it's not a question with us. We understand. We embrace all of those texts. But in those texts, the sovereignty of God does not teach uh, that God's moral law is absolute uh, in the sense of our conduct to it uh, or our conduct from it. It certainly does not. Now, what is an absoluter? An absoluter is a religious... Fatalist. That's 
That's what an absoluter is. A fatalist is one who assigns whatever comes to pass, whatever happens uh, to fate. And they don't necessarily uh, state what faith is. Some believes it's this, some believes it's that, some believes it's to the other. Uh, those in idolatry do not uh, assign it to the one true and living God. But what we understand is an absoluter and those that back in time, uh, back through the years and at certain times in certain areas uh, that have troubled uh, the old church uh, and have gotten the name of absoluter is a, a religious fatalist that believes that God has predetermined whatsoever comes to pass. I don't believe that. I don't believe it for a minute. That God has predetermined whatsoever comes to pass as far as our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our actions. Most of you sitting here have never been troubled with that. Most of you sitting here have never been bothered with that. Most of you, if you've never read history, you may have never even heard of it. In 1885, in the Mount Zion Association in North Alabama was what was called the Blue Shelton Controversy. And... Uh, Shelton became an absoluter. And he wrote and he preached and he taught uh, uh, concerning that. Uh, and a great division that, that spurred and came about. He was excluded in 1883 uh, from Salem uh, Primitive Baptist Church. Uh, and one of the charges uh, was that of heresy for writing and teaching and preaching the absolute predestination of all things. He disturbed many churches. If you want, you can, if you read a book, but most of you know Elder Kenneth Watts, and you may have known his father, Elder E.B. Watts. He wrote a wonderful history of Primitive Baptists of Alabama, and particularly the Mount Zion Association uh, that was published by Elder Tolly in uh, 1979. Uh, and that'd be something else good to re reproduce, uh, to reprint, Brother David. Uh, uh, to bring out because it brings out uh, a lot of things uh, uh, that, that are pertinent that our people uh, uh, have lost sight of or never was uh, uh, confronted with or whatever. Thank God you haven't been. The Mount Zion Association has not been bothered with absolutism for 110 years. Elder Shelton died in 1904. And uh, after his death, several congregations that had kindly split some and so forth, uh, they came back together. But there were some other churches, uh, three in particular that I'm thinking about now, but all three uh, have gone out. Uh, they have gone extinct. They are no longer in existence because they held to that doctrine. Uh, and what did it do? It killed them all. The absolute predestination of all things doctrine will kill a church. It will kill off a congregation. You can see it in area after area after area. I tell you, God's Word is full of admonitions and exhortations. And God's Word and God's people must be exhorted to their duty. Now I tell you, if you believe the, uh, the pre uh, predetermining or predestination of all things whatsoever comes to pass, God pre-programmed it uh, and, and, and it's of God's will and, and it couldn't be any other way. Uh, that's how the, the, the Nick uh, name statement came about and they were called can't help it. Now can you understand why it would lead you to that conclusion, I can't help it? Huh? If you believe that God had predetermined whatsoever come to pass, then whatever you did, you couldn't do any different from that. Therefore, you couldn't help it. Now, we were told earlier that folks, uh, uh, they don't come to church because uh, they don't want to. But if they believe that predetermining doctrine, they'd say, I can't help it. You know, I heard a few years ago, a little bit of that doctrine that's left over among a family in North Alabama. I heard a man say of his brother that he, who was raised in that uh, uh, made the statement and said uh, his brother, natural brother said that he wouldn't go to church unless God made him. You see the conclusion that people draw from when hearing that rotten doctrine taught over and over and over that God is predestinated whatsoever comes to pass. He came to the conclusion that the only way he was going to go to church was if God made him. 
And therefore, if he did go to church, then that's evidence that he had been predetermined to go to church. But if he wouldn't go into church, then it's evidence that he wouldn't predetermined to go to church. You see the folly of that? You see how warped and how twisted that can become? And God's children, as far as discipleship, can fall away, can fall away from their duty and their responsibility. The Apostle Paul said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. Oh, and on the same sense there, uh, dearly beloved, uh, uh, think about the scripture uh, there in Titus uh, 2 and 12, I believe it is, when he said, talking about, well, let's back up just a little bit to the verse before, and says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Now, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, uh, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Uh, uh, there he's talking about the Spirit of God that comes in and, and resides uh, uh, within us in, in the new birth. Uh, uh, that there is a teaching uh, in the heart and in the mind. Uh, uh, that there is an accusing and an excusing uh, uh, that goes on within. Uh, but the very Spirit of God, the very grace of God uh, uh, within us teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldliness unrighteousness that we should live. It didn't say that we would absolutely live soberly and righteously and godly, but that we should live that way. Now we should live that way. And yes, we should. But I want to tell you, the, the Spirit of God is not certainly not going to go against God. If God has foreordained or predetermined uh, for us uh, to an ungodly act, uh, and then uh, uh, the Holy Ghost is there teaching us against in our heart to, and mind, teaching us and bringing conviction against that ungodliness, uh, then you got the uh, God the Father and God the Holy Ghost uh, working against each other. And I want to tell you, the Trinity does not work against each other. They agree in one and they work harmoniously. And just like Brother Heath was preaching to us, amen, Jesus only died for the ones the Father gave him. The Holy Ghost only brings life uh, to the ones that Jesus died for and the Father had given Jesus. We see that working uh, between uh, the three and one God, uh, between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, God, uh, uh, and let me before before I go to that, I'm kind of getting ahead in my mind. Uh, with that doctrine that, that people believe that God is predetermined whatsoever comes to pass. Whatever it is, if it comes to pass, I mean God predetermined it. And that God's uh, uh, knowing is based upon His predetermining. That God knows everything because He predetermined everything. Now I'm going to tell you, that's false too. That's false too. God does not know everything because He predetermined everything. God knows everything because He's God. Because that's His attribute. And because He is the eternal God. And that everything is now with God. I believe last year uh, in the association, I made this statement in preaching in, in up at uh, uh, Good Hope. And uh, that God... Dwelled in the first second of time at the same time that he dwelled in the last second of time and every second in between. Just, just trying to show forth that God is eternal and that everything, our past, our present, our future is now with God. Is. I am that I am. As the old colored preacher said, I is that I is. Amen. He is. He is now, right now, and everything is now before Him. It is not past, present, and future. God knows because God is everywhere absent, and God is everywhere present, nowhere absent, and God knows everything. Proverbs tells us that God is in every place, Beholding the good and the evil. God is in every place beholding it. 
Now in that sense, what is it teaching us God is in every place beholding the good and the evil? He's in every place. He's everywhere. uh, Present, nowhere absent. And he knows uh, exactly what is. Whether it's our past, present, or our future. But now, we got a little bit different scenario. And I need to turn there to this. That's found in Habakkuk. In Habakkuk chapter 1. And we have the prophet Habakkuk during the first two chapters with a conversation backwards and forth between him and God. And we have the prophet speaking and asking the question primarily, why does God suffer sin? Why does God suffer injustice? Now this is a, another point uh, that, that the absolute or errs in and does not understand. I want to tell you that God suffers with, endures with, bears with sin and wickedness. He bears with it. Now in case you don't believe that, you just go over to Peter and you'll read where that God... Uh, The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah when the ark was preparing wherein uh, a few, uh, eight souls, uh, uh, were saved by water. Now, the long-suffering of God, the enduring of God, the the, the bearing with the sin and the wickedness. God said the very thoughts uh, and their imagination uh, uh, was evil. It was sinful. Uh, And uh, uh, so God uh, bore with it uh, instead of sending the rain uh, immediately and breaking up the the firmament above and the fountain of the deep below uh, and and a flood coming on the earth. uh, God bore with it. Until the ark was prepared for the saving of Noah and his family. I can read in Romans chapter 9 where God endured uh, the vessels of wrath, suffering with them. Turn, you can turn there later and get the very language of that. But that's another place showing of God bearing with a, a sin. Now, I tell you, if God is suffering it, if God's bearing with it, if God's having to endure it, then friend, He sure didn't predetermine it. He sure didn't predetermine it. Now, You then go on starting in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Habakkuk and you're going to read and talk about where God is going to use the Chaldeans in bringing chastisement and judgment upon the children of Israel. And then you come on down to verse 12 and the prophet is speaking to God and talking with God about basically, God, why should you use uh, the wicked And he says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Now, now we just went over a verse back over in Proverbs that said that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. But that's a different way that He's beholding the good and the evil from what He's talking about here. Of thou uh, of pure eyes than to behold uh, evil and canst not look on iniquity. In Proverbs, when it's talking about the Lord is in every place, uh, uh, beholding the good and the evil, it's talking about that God is t- teaching us of God's uh, omnipresence uh, and of God's omniscience. Uh, uh, that God uh, uh, is everywhere absent, uh, everywhere present and nowhere absent, and that God knows everything and that God sees everything. He knows everything. Because he sees everything. Because it's present with him. It's ever present with him. And from that standpoint, he beholds it. But now, the, listen to the understanding of Habakkuk concerning this religious principle or this religious thinking of theology and of his understanding of God Jehovah 
that created the heaven and the earth. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. God does not look upon evil approvingly. And evil in that aspect of it right there is meaning uh, sin and wickedness. Now many times the word evil in the Bible means different things far as trouble, calamity, uh, things along that line. Uh, Just for one example that people wouldn't necessarily think of in another sense because every time you see the word evil, it's not meaning sin and wickedness. If you'll remember back over there in Genesis, you'll remember where when they brought the coat that they had put the blood upon of the animal that they had killed, that Jacob, it was in his mind and what he understood when it was presented unto him, that he had been killed by an evil beast. Remember that language? An evil beast. That word evil right there didn't mean a... It didn't mean a sinful or wicked beast. No. It meant a harmful beast. And it was probably a bear. And in his mind's thinking, he was probably thinking it was a bear or a lion. And because you see, they were to that natural geographical area far as harmful. That's what shepherds had to look out for in that geographical area was of bears and lions. And, and, and I can prove that from, from a Bible standpoint because David told Saul how that he had slew the bear and he had killed the lion when he was out tending to his father's flock. So those are the two harmful animals that would have been under consideration, the bear and the lion. But, they're, but, it, but the scripture, uh, the, uh, the translation says, uh, an evil beast. That's what Jacob thought. They, they let him believe a lie, right? They let him believe a lie. They didn't tell him that's what it was, but they let him to believe it. And that's what he had in his mind that it was. But, but the point that I'm making from that is that the word evil right there does not mean sin and wickedness. It meant a harmful beast. He thought a harmful beast had gotten a hold of his son. But right here uh, where this word is used uh, and it's in connection with iniquity. Thou art of pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look upon iniquity. Now, if God's eyes are so pure, in other words, God is, is pure. You know, I have to speak as a man. I just don't have the, the vocabulary uh, to express concerning God. Uh, but, but let's get something from the year 2017 uh, uh, that, that you would relate to. A lot of times when you're trying to talk about something and, and you're trying to express it that it's 100%, uh, uh, you might use the language and the expression and say, oh, that's 110%. In other words, you're trying to really emphasize that it's full, that it's complete, that there's nothing lacking. But I want to tell you that when it comes to purity, when it comes to holiness, God is 110%. And this is what the prophet understands. And this is what he's saying right here. God, your eyes, they're too pure. You're too pure. Oh, you're holy. You're pure. You're undefiled. You want uh, approvingly, this is what it's meaning, to behold, to, to approve of this. Oh, I want to tell you, God does not approve of sin and wickedness. God hates sin and wickedness. And if God hates it, then how in the world can you ascribe it to Him? Then how in the world can you charge it to Him? How in the world can you say that he predetermined it? I tell you, you can't. And be honest about it. You can and be honest about it. You cannot. Oh, when you consider uh, this uh, uh, from that very standpoint, I could turn over and read in James uh, uh, 3 and 10. uh, There, uh, uh, where he says concerning about the brethren speaking uh, 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 things of blessing and cursing uh, out of their mouth, uh, he tells them that that ought not to be. 
And if that ought not to be, then God certainly did not predetermine them to do that when the Word of God says that it shouldn't have been. Now, you'd have God working against Himself. You'd have God fighting against His own predestination, His own predetermining. And that's confusion. And somebody this morning said, (laughs) Amen, that God is not the author of confusion. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. And just like lying is a sin and God cannot lie, I tell you, that confusion is a sin. God's not the author of sin. And and, and God's not the author of confusion. He's not the author of sin. God knows everything. But He does not know it because He predetermined it. God did not predetermine for Adam to do what He did in the garden. God did not predetermine for Adam uh, to break the holy command that God gave him. God would be unjust if he gave a command uh, knowing that he had predetermined for that command to be broken and then chastise uh, the man for doing it. That don't even make good nonsense. Don't make good nonsense. And folks have to have help to be led off in that direction. But there's been help. There's been help in the past. And I pray God that we're not ever faced with it again on any grand scale. That we're never faced with it again on any large scale. There might be those from time to time that would get off a little bit. But I tell you, uh, I've heard it and I've said it myself. You know the best way to get heresy out of the church is preach it out. (laughs) Amen. Preach it out. And I tell you, preaching ought to be going on and teaching, amen, of all of God's Word and of all of these lines uh, so that when it comes up, folks knows what the Word of God says in advance. Knows what the Word of God says. Elder Claude Casey said nearly a hundred years ago when an absoluter made some statements to him along some lines... And Elder Casey let him know real quick that God did not create a nasty little devil to do his lying for him. Amen. Now that take another 30 minutes to get into. But I'm going to leave it right there. I want to tell you, God is not the author of sin. God did not ordain sin. He does not approve of sin. He has not predetermined sin, but God hates sin. You know, there's, there were some folks of the children of Israel... Uh, And you can read about it in three different places in Jeremiah. And particularly, you go back over here to the first. And and, and I'm going to go right there. uh, uh, Because most of you aren't going to do anything after a while anyway. Uh, You're just going to wait on supper. Uh, But nevertheless, in Jeremiah chapter 7, these people uh, have the audacity uh, because God tells them what they're thinking and what they're talking about. Uh, Remember, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 4 when the Philistines had come and they called to Shiloh uh, to go get the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, And when Israel was losing uh, with them and the Philistines, and when they brought the Ark of the Covenant down there, Israel began to rejoice because the Ark of the, of the Covenant represented the presence of God. But I want to tell you, uh, they were in idolatry because they were actually worshiping the Ark of the Covenant rather than the God of the Ark of the Covenant. Those Philistines heard that big commotion going on and they began to get weary and it started going through the ranks. And oh, oh we, we've heard of this God. And then there were some Philistines that rose up among them and started talking to them and said, Hey, quiet ye like men. Act like men. Settle down. Quit listening to the, to the loudness and the roar and the rejoicing uh, of the children of Israel. And when they got them settled down, uh, then the Philistines destroyed so many of Israel. See, they, they were trusting in the ark rather than the God of the ark. Now, God reminds uh, Israel through Jeremiah, or Judah, of this uh, in verse 12 when he said, But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it for the weakness of my people Israel. 
Now I said that to say this. Uh, because now these people, uh, they are trusting in the temple. They're not looking to the God of the temple. And uh, they're so looking to the temple and so forth uh, and to justification of their sins uh, and, and, and of their self-righteousness uh, and, and, and that they're all right and all of that, uh, that they've got the audacity that they're coming into God's house. Uh, and uh, uh, listen to what God says in Jeremiah chapter 7, starting with verse 8. Behold, ye trust in lying words uh, that cannot profit. Uh, will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn in sense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations oh yeah they were justifying themselves we've got the temple with us we're all right God says you don't come in this place trusting in this place and for these sins that you've been committing God says Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place. So now, so here the Lord uh, is is speaking this and teaching uh, them of this. And then then you turn over to Jeremiah uh, chapter 19. I want you to, to notice that. In Jeremiah chapter 19. What is it? Long about verse 4 and 5. Because they have forsaken me and have uh, estranged this place and have burned incense in it unto other gods whom neither uh, they nor their fathers have known nor the kings of Judah and have filled this place with the blood of innocence. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn uh, their sons uh, with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal which I commanded not. Notice that. Nor spake it. Neither came it into my mind. God says, you folks come in here in my house and you talk about your, your, uh, passing your children through child sacrifice unto false gods and stealing and lying and committing adultery and say that I delivered you to do it. I predetermined you to do it. God said, I never even thought about that. It never came in my mind. I never spake it. That's not my doings. It's your doings is what God is saying. It's your doings. You're guilty. You're responsible. Let me ask you a question. Do we have child sacrifice in this country today? We sure do. There's been over 50 million over the last decades that have been aborted from the womb, babies. I want to tell you, God never determined it. He never thought it. He never spake it. It never came into his mind. Now how did it come about? Well, we could go over to James and we can tell you how it came about. It comes about from this own uh, uh, lust and sinful nature. Uh, It's where it has its root and offspring. Uh, And to what God are they being sacrificed to? They're being sacrificed to the humanistic God of convenience. The humanistic God of convenience. 90% or better of abortions that takes place is out of the reasoning, is out of the excuses of convenience. And once again, God never predetermined that. We could go on and on and on with this. When we'll come to a close. But before we ever buy into that God knows everything because He predetermined it, or that God predetermines whatsoever comes to pass, we better look at what's coming to pass and look at it and think about it and realize that sin and weakness, God's too pure, God's too holy, God's undefiled, He's consecrated. He's separate from sinners. Right. Right. 
And, he, and, and God is so high above, so pure and so holy. And that's what we've got to keep our mind upon and our focus upon ever is the purity and the holiness of God and that God is so high above that he can, God, doesn't, he, God does not look upon sin ever in an approving way. Thank you for your time and attention.